Thank you, Seth. Good morning. We are continuing our studies in the book of Jeremiah, and we're actually concluding them this morning with chapter 52. And I am not going to read every verse. I'm going to read the first 11 verses and then the last verses beginning with verse 31. So, Jeremiah 52, beginning with verse 1. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, like all that Jehoiakim had done. For through the anger of the Lord this came about in Jerusalem and Judah, until he cast them out from his presence. And Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Now it came about in the ninth year of his reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army against Jerusalem, camped against it and built a siege wall around it. So the city was under siege until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then the city was broken into and all the men of war fled and went forth from the city at night by way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden. Through the Chaldeans, though the Chaldeans were all around the city, and they went by way of the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Hamath, and he passed sentence on him. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and he also slaughtered the princes of Judah in Riblah. Then he blinded the eyes of Zedekiah, and the king of Babylon bound him with bronze fetters and brought him to Babylon and put him in prison until the day of his death. Verse 31. Now it came about in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 25th of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in his first year, in the first year of his reign, showed favor to Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. Then he spoke kindly to him and set his throne above the thrones of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin changed his prison clothes and had his meals in the king's presence regularly all the days of his life. For his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king of Babylon, a daily portion all the days of his life until the day of his death. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time together in it. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. One of the best lines in a Christian hymn is from William Cooper's God Moves in a Mysterious Way. He wrote, Of the clouds ye so much dread, breaking in blessing on your head. And then the line, Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust Him for His grace. Behind a frowning providence, He hides a smiling face. That's true for God's people. And the book of Jeremiah is an example of that. Warnings of judgment rumble through its pages like the thunder of a gathering storm. And now at the end, 
in the final chapter, the storm breaks. Jerusalem falls. The nation is swept away, left, it would seem, on the ash heap of history. Derek Kidner summarized the chapter in four parts. Jerusalem was dethroned, verses 1 through 11, demolished, verses 12 through 16, desecrated, verses 17 through 23, and depopulated, verses 24 through 30. Dethroned, demolished, desecrated, depopulated. That's dismal. But then at the very end of the chapter, the last verses, in far off Babylon there was a glimmer of hope for Israel, for Judah, like a ray of light shining through a black cloud. It's the smiling face in providence. There's a hopeful ending to an otherwise grim chapter, but a necessary chapter, a kind of epilogue to the book because it is proof that Jeremiah's prophecies were true. They were fulfilled. And just as God fulfilled the prophet's warnings of judgment, he will fulfill his prophecies of blessing which will break wonderfully on his people. That's how the chapter ends. First, though, the frowning providence. Verses 1 through 11. They are about the king being dethroned. They give a Summary of Zedekiah's 11-year reign in Jerusalem and his tragic end. Zedekiah was the son of Josiah, the righteous king. And he was made king by Nebuchadnezzar in 597 B.C. when he was 21 years old. His brother, King Jehoiakim, was deposed and died. Jehoiakim's son, Jehoiachin, was king briefly for three months. Then he was deposed, imprisoned in Babylon, and his uncle Zedekiah replaced him when Nebuchadnezzar put him on the throne. He was no different from the rest of those kings, those sons of Josiah, his brothers. Verse, verses 2 and 3 state that to state two facts about him that sum up his life and reign. He did evil in the sight of the Lord like that, of Je like that Jehoiakim had done, and he rebelled against the king of Babylon. Only a few years after swearing loyalty to, them, to Nebuchadnezzar as one of his vassals, he added to his treachery by breaking faith with the king and joining an alliance with Egypt. Repeatedly, Jeremiah told him to surrender to the Babylonians, but Zedekiah was afraid of the super patriots among the Jews. He thought that they would kill him for surrendering, so he disobeyed the prophet. He feared men rather than God, and he paid dearly for it. The Babylonians returned to Jerusalem and kept the city under siege for over a year from the 10th month of the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign to the eleventh year. A siege is a terrible thing. It can go on for months, even a year, and it destroys a population. David McCullough wrote of the siege of Paris during the Franco-Prussian War in his book, The Greater Journey. They ate all the cattle, then the horses, then butchered the animals in the Paris Zoo. Eventually the people were eating all the dogs, cats, and rats in the city. People died from hunger and cold. Now that's typical of what occurs in the siege of a city. People eat whatever they can. They eat uh, leather objects like uh, horses harnesses and shoes. And then last of all, they eat people. Cannibalism. Horrible thing. And it was like that during Jerusalem's year of siege. Jeremiah wrote of it in chapter 4 of the book of Lamentations of the, the thirsty and starving infants and the people. 
desolate in the streets, and he's describing the upper class there. Finally, in desperation, on the fourth month of the 11th year, with the city's food supply exhausted, the king and his army broke out of the city and escaped. Somehow they were able to, to make their way through the Babylonian lines and down through the Judean desert, but not much further. The Babylonians pursued them to the plains of Jericho where Zedekiah's army deserted him. Verse 8 says, it was scattered from him and Zedekiah was captured. He was taken north to Nebuchadnezzar's headquarters in Riblah on the Syrian border where his sons and friends, the princes captured with him, were killed before his eyes. Then his eyes were blinded. It was a terrible punishment. The last thing he ever saw was his children being killed. Then he was bound in chains and taken to Babylon. He was not slain with the others, probably so that they could parade him through the streets of Babylon as the, the, the trophy of war. There he was put in prison and stayed in prison till the day of his death. The city soon fell, and the next portion of the chapter, verses 12 through 22, describe the, the uh, systematic destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Nebu Zeradan, the captain of the guard, the field commander, entered Jerusalem actually a month after the walls had been taken down, had been breached rather, and, and he set about leveling the city, demolishing it in Kidner's words. He burned the temple, the royal palaces and the great houses and other important buildings were destroyed. He pulled down the walls and then carried away the captives and the temple treasures to Babylon. He left only the poorest people behind in a city that had been demolished, a city that had been razed to the ground. It was complete devastation. The spoils of the temple that were taken to Babylon are recorded in verses 17 through 19. Now the bronze pillars which belong to the house of the Lord and that stand and, and the stands and the bronze sea which were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried all their bronze to Babylon. They also took away the pots, the shovels, the snuffers, the basins, the pans, and all the bronze vessels which were used in temple service. The captain of the guard also took away the bowls, the fire pans, the basins, the pots, the lampstands, the pans, and the drink offering bowls, what was fine gold and what was fine silver. Took everything they could. This was a fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy in chapter 27. Earlier, the Babylonians carried off other vessels from the temple when Jehoiachin son of Jehoiakim, uh, was taken captive and they took the early captives to Babylon at that time in the year 597. Later, during the reign of Zedekiah, the false prophets in Jerusalem were saying that all would be well. They were prophesying peace, as those earlier had done, that everything would be fine, all would be well, the city would survive, and all the things that had been taken in that first captivity would be returned to Jerusalem. God was going to fight for them. And so they encouraged the city to resist the Babylonians, while Jeremiah did just the opposite. He warned against that. The city must submit to God's discipline. This is not going to go well for the people. They must not resist God's will and His discipline if they were to survive. Well, they said all would be restored. He said it would not. In fact, everything that had been left behind, the bronze pillars, the bronze sea, the vessels would be taken. And 
they were taken. So this was the fulfillment of his prophecy. And it, it was a massive undertaking by the Babylonians to transport all of that across the desert to Babylon. The amount of bronze is described in verses 20 through 23. You can see it just at the end of verse 20. The bronze of all these vessels was beyond weight. And you get a sense of that when he describes the pillars in verse 21. As for the pillars, the height of each pillar was 18 cubits, and it was 12 cubits in circumference, and four fingers in thickness and hollow. So these were massive pillars that Solomon had cast when the temple was built. They stood in the front. They didn't hold anything up. The, the appearance, I think, was holding the sky up, holding the universe up, as it were, God doing that. But these massive pillars stood. They were hollow, but they were the four fingers in width around. This is a massive amount of bronze. But they broke it up and took it away, as well as the, the bronze sea, which was the laver of water that was placed in before the tabernacle, which the priests would do their ceremonial washings in. It was five cubits tall, which was just under nine feet. Under it were four, or rather 12 oxen that held it up. It was a massive amount of bronze as well, but they broke all of this up, which shows the determination of the Babylonians to crush the resistance. And it shows the certainty of God's word. If the people had thought that, that, that Jeremiah's prophecy was absurd, that, that no one could carry off those great pillars, then circumstances proved them wrong and proved God true. The city's rebellion resulted in its complete destruction and the temple's desecration, which was significant because the people thought that the very presence of the temple was their insurance, was uh, kept them safe. This was God's throne. Surely they, no one can overthrow God's throne. In fact, back in chapter 7, there's recorded this this uh, chant almost that the priests gave, and that is, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. It's almost a kind of mantra that they would speak if they thought we're secure because of the temple. Jeremiah told them those words are deceptive. It's a false confidence. But they didn't listen. So, its ruin was a shock and the removal of the two pillars was symbolic because it showed that, that God, who was the, the sovereign of the nation, the sovereign of the universe, the one who holds it all up, had departed from that building, that place, and from that people. The pillars of the temple signified that especially. When Solomon cast them, he, he gave those two pillars names called the first one Yachin, which means he will establish, and Boaz in his strength. The breaking up of those great bronze pillars was proof that God would not establish that place, and he would not strengthen his people. He gave them over to the enemy. In verses 24 through 27, the end of the priest's and officials of the temple is described. They were taken to Nebuchadnezzar Ribla, along with other high officials. And all of them were executed. Verse 27, Then the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Ribla in the, in the land of Hamath. So Judah was led away into exile from its land. It is completely futile to resist the Word of God. Those who oppose God cannot escape the consequences. In the end, they lose their possessions and many of them lost their lives. Rebellion is insane. The nation learned that. Its situations seem completely hopeless. The 
king was dethroned, the city sacked, the temple burned, its priests killed, the people carried off to Babylon, swallowed up by a pagan nation. The book of Lamentations begins with the prophet looking over Jerusalem in ruins and saying, how lonely sits the city that was full of people. The glories of Solomon gone, it was a ghost town. But all of that had meaning. For one thing, it, it showed that God is true. His word is to be trusted. Through the, pro through the prophet, he told the nation what would happen, and here it's recorded in detail. And it's one of many examples of God's justice. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. Verse 3 states, for, for through the anger of the Lord this came about in Jerusalem. God willed this to happen. This is his response to their heart that was hardened and their sin and the rebellion against him. Now, we have seen as we study through this book the patience of God. Jeremiah had a long ministry of calling the people to repentance, warning them of the danger to come, telling them what they needed to do. And that doesn't include a generation before where Isaiah was preaching to this nation. Generation after generation, God sent prophet after prophet and gave warning after warning to these people. He is a long-suffering God. He takes no delight in the death of the wicked, as Ezekiel would say, in captivity after all of this. His anger, though, comes. But his anger is righteous. It is always just. It is always just. It is always right. But it is always terrible. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. People dismiss that or ignore it to their ultimate shame. God will judge the nations. God would judge Babylon. God judges all the nations. That, in fact, is the subject of the last chapters of the book of Jeremiah, chapters 46 through 51. He will establish righteousness on this earth. He will rule over all of them. He will judge the nations, but this chapter is about judgment on Jerusalem. And since that was judgment on God's people, the proper application of all this, at least it seems to me, is to the church, not to the world. In fact, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, it is time for judgment to begin in the household of God. Begin in the household of God. Our privileged position as children of God does not exempt us from divine discipline. In fact, it ensures that we will experience divine discipline. That's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, and Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12. Those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, like a father disciplines his son. If there's no discipline, there's no love, and because He loves us, He will discipline us when we need it. He, he sifts congregations in order to separate the true from the false, and then he disciplines the true to correct them, to, to make them holy. It is necessary. It is good. But it's very hard. And we should take the warning and know that the way to avoid discipline is through obedience. So this is a chapter that, at least by implication and principle, makes it clear that we must remain faithful to the Lord in spite of the circumstances, in spite of the, the various messages we hear around us that contradict the message of this book. We are to remain faithful in spite of everything. That, that is true of us individually as Christians. It is true for us as a church. Warnings of that were given to the churches at the beginning of the book of Revelation, in chapters 2 and 3, and the first one in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, 
is the church of Ephesus. And the Lord speaks to that church and he has words of high praise. He tells them that he knows their deeds and their toil and their perseverance. In fact, as you read through the commendation that he gives of that church, you think this is the perfect church. We should all aspire to be like this church at Ephesus. They defended the truth. They didn't tolerate evil men. They put them to the test who claimed to be apostles but were not. They were a knowledgeable congregation. They knew the truth and they used the truth. And they paid a price for that. He said that they endured much for his name's sake. They went through difficulty and they were faithful. They did not grow weary. Sounds like the perfect church. Yet, the Lord said in verse 4, I have this against you. You have left your first love. So he tells the church at Ephesus to repent or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Eventually that happened. You can walk down the streets of Ephesus today. It's a ghost town without people and without a church. Well, I think that's a passage that should cause each of us to do some reflection. And, and that is, why are we here? Out of, out, of, out of habit? Or are we here because we love the Lord and we want to know of Him? I have to ask myself that question. I have no choice but to be here. Uh, but am I here because I want to be here? Because I love the Lord? Because I, I hope so. But these are the kind of questions that we should ask ourselves. And, and if this church is not faithful to the truth and faithful in our walk with the Lord, and if we have left our first love, though we go through the motions and we have all of the forms and all of that that we need, and we even defend the truth, and here we are on Resurrection Sunday, and we can say sola scriptura, scripture alone's our authority, and we can defend the doctrines, but we don't love the Lord, then perhaps the lampstand in this assembly also will be removed, and this building will be empty of spiritual life like that ruined temple of Jerusalem was. So this recounting of the, the grim events that overtook Jerusalem, I think, has a lesson for us, has a lesson for me. But again, the, the details of the destruction of the judgment were given in order to vindicate Jeremiah. He was a true prophet, as events proved. And all of the other preachers of his day were shown to be false. Early on in the book, their message was recount, recounted. It was, peace, peace. But Jeremiah said, there is no peace. He said, they heal the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially. In other words, it was a shallow message that they gave. There was no healing in it because it was false. But it's what the people wanted to hear. They didn't want to hear about judgment. They didn't want to hear about repentance. They wanted to hear, you're okay, I'm okay, everything's going to be fine. It's the problem that uh, Paul speaks of in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, of people having itching ears or wanting their ears tickled. Well, that was the people of Jeremiah's day, and the false prophets accommodated them. They gave them the message they wanted to hear, and they were popular preachers. That's how you become popular, I guess. You preach what people want to hear, but it was a false hope they gave. There was no healing in it. It wasn't the Word of God. Jeremiah preached the truth. He preached what God gave to him. He was faithful to the message and he paid the price for being faithful in personal rejection and persecution. Remember, he had a long ministry. So he had a protracted experience of rejection and persecution, being beaten, put in stocks, mocked publicly, 
jail, drop down a dark, claustrophobic cistern. In the end, he was taken against his will down to Egypt by some rebellious Jews where his life ended in exile. We don't read about his death. We just read about him being taken down there. That's chapters 42 and 43, but we do have an indication of what happened because of the chapters that follow, because there we read of the prophecies that he continued to give, prophecies against the nations, about the nations, what it tells us is that even there in Egypt, he was faithful. Well, why was that? What was his hope? People are faithful because they have hope. What encouraged him to remain steadfast in spite of the, the, the harsh and the disappointing circumstances? And you remember the things, some of the things we've covered, but as you read through the book, you will see how he became a very discouraged man at times. He couldn't understand why he was going through these things. He, well, how is it that he managed to recover from that and stay faithful to the end? What was it that gave him hope? Well, it's very simple. It's the Word of God. It's what he was given to preach. He believed it. Which means he trusted the Lord, not, as the hymn put it, his feeble sense. When he was called recorded back in chapter 1 and verse 5, the Lord informed him of his election. He said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. Before he ever existed, from all eternity, God loved him and chose him. So he would never abandon him in time. One of the things about the doctrine of election, people are troubled by that doctrine. They shouldn't be. It's a very encouraging doctrine. If God knew you from all eternity, if there was never a moment in his existence when he didn't know you, and that means have a personal love and relationship with you even before you were born, knowing everything you would do, everything you would be, that all fit within his eternal plan for you and the world, why in time do you think he'd forsake you? No, he, he is faithful, and he was faithful to him. And he is true and faithful to every believer, and every believer is elect. We're not elect because we believe, we believe because we are elect. But every elect person does believe, and continues in that faith, and perseveres in it. And the Lord is faithful to his people. His word is sure and it is reliable. And here, the Lord's word is demonstrated to be true and Jeremiah's ministry genu demonstrated to be genuine. The false prophets and the apostate priests were all gone, either put to the sword or put in exile. And Jeremiah is vindicated. But Jeremiah's prophecies were not all judgment and doom. He also gave prophecies that were hopeful. Prophecies of a future for both Israel and Judah and the nations. He too prophesied priests, uh, rather peace, but he prophesied it correctly. In chapter 33, he prophesied restoration for the nation. The Lord said, I will heal them and I will reveal to them an abundance of peace and truth. It's the healing and peace of the new covenant. The covenant that obtains for us and guarantees for us salvation, justification, and glorification. When the end came and Jerusalem and the temple were in ruins, empty of people, it didn't appear that, that, that there would be a, fruit, a future for that nation at all. No hope of healing, no hope of peace. From all appearances... Everything was at an end. From all appearances, it was over. Israel and Judah had gone the way of the Hittites and other ancient peoples that have disappeared from history. But that was only the appearance. God's word cannot fail. Far away in Babylon, there was a glimmer of hope, a, a silver lining in that dark cloud. We read of that in verses 31 through 34. 
Now it came about in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 25th of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, showed favor to Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. Then he spoke kindly to him and set his throne above the thrones of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin changed his prison clothes and had his meals in the king's presence regularly all the days of his life. For his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king of Babylon, a daily portion all the days of his life until the day of his death. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he went into prison. After 37 years, he was 55 years old when he was finally released. That's a long time to be in confinement. No reason is given for evil Merodach being so favorable to the king of Judah. Ultimately, we find the answer, I think, in the Lord. God works in the heart, and he caused him to be to deal kindly with King Jehoiachin. I think it's the Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. That's the explanation. And the change that he experienced after so long a time in prison offers encouragement to those who endure long periods of trial, long difficulties. Providence can change your situation. Your situation follows the course that the Lord has, and He can bring you out of that. And, and for the child of God, He will do that, ultimately. Whether here or in eternity to come, it will change. And this providence changed for him, for Jehoiachin. Well, we have that prayer for change, or the providence of God, and to bless in, in Psalm 100, and rather in Psalm 90, verse 15, make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us and the years we have seen evil. So I think there's an encouragement in that for those who go through difficulty. But more to the point, this was a great encouragement to the captives of Judah. This happened at just about the midnight of their captivity, as uh, Matthew Henry called it. Half of the 70 years had passed when the king was elevated. And it was a sign to the captives that God was with them and that he would put an end to their captivity just as he had promised, just as he had prophesied. But more than that, it was a sign that the Lord had disciplined the house of David for its unfaithfulness, but had not rejected it, had not cast them off. Jehoiachin was David's rightful heir and link in the Messianic line. In fact, you read his name in Matthew chapter 1, verse 11. Now there it is Jeconiah, a, na a name that was given to him, but he's, it's Jehoiachin. So, Jeremiah's book ends with great hope. The line of David was not extinguished. The promises of a Davidic king and a redeemer would stand. The new covenant in chapter 31 would be fulfilled. The Lord would come. He would redeem his people and give them the glorious future that he had promised. The Old Testament scholar John Bright explained the chapter this way. The chapter seems to say the divine word has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled. It's a simple statement. I think that's accurate. That's, that's uh, true of what the meaning of this chapter is. God, fu God fulfilled the promises that he, he made through Jeremiah, the warnings, and he will fulfill those that have yet to be fulfilled. And again, what this last chapter demonstrates is that Jeremiah was a true prophet. It is an epilogue or a postscript to the book added to prove that Jeremiah's word came true. I think we can apply that to ourselves. When we stand for the truth, we will face opposition. And Jeremiah is something of a model for us in that regard. What happened to him could happen to us. We may even 
die in this world without being vindicated before men. But that will not be the last word. Each of us will have an epilogue. We will have a postscript, a PS attached to our lives that will vindicate us before men. So we should be faithful to the truth in spite of the opposition that we may experience. Christ will someday set everything straight. And he will say to his people, he will say to those who are faithful, well done, good and faithful servant. And all creation will see it, all creation will know it. We can rely on that. The future of God's people is absolutely secure. The Lord has promised to be faithful to us and to vindicate us. He will do that. His word cannot fall to the ground. So, we're to be faithful, as Jeremiah was. He suffered much, but continued to proclaim God's word in spite of that, and at great risk. He did so out of love for his people. We've commented on it numerous times. He's known as the weeping prophet. He wept for them, for their unbelief, for what was coming. But he did it also out of love for the Lord, principally out of love for the Lord and complete trust in Him. The Lord always proved faithful to him. He made him, as he said he would do in the first chapter, a fortified city and a wall of bronze. He was beaten down by his enemies. He sometimes gave way. He felt the pressure of it, the pain of it. But he always recovered and he remained faithful. And the Lord will do the same for us. We walk by faith day by day. Trust the Lord, believing His Word. And He will faithfully provide for us today and each day and bless us for all eternity. It may not seem like it, but the hymn writer got it right. Behind a frowning providence, He hides a smiling face. Spurgeon got a picture of that one night. He was staying by the seashore when a storm occurred. The voice of the Lord was upon the waters, he said. He left his room and he stood out on the seashore and watched the flashes of lightning like I saw last Sunday night as I was leaving church out to the west. I saw these flashes of lightning. A storm was coming. Well, he stood there and watched that amazing sight and then he heard the peals of thunder over the roaring, churning sea. The sky was so dark with clouds that the stars were blotted out, except once, far off on the horizon, he noticed a bright light shining like gold, he said. It was the moon hidden behind the clouds, shining not on him, but shining on the distant water out to the, to before him. And and, and he thought, as he saw that, of Isaiah. And may, maybe also thought of Jeremiah, who, who stood in a similar position when, when they wrote their words of the Messiah, and they wrote of hope. All around them was darkness, and all they heard around them were the words of the false prophets. And they heard in all of that what Spurgeon called prophetic, thunders roaring, and saw flashes of divine vengeance. But off in the distance, that's where our hope is, shining like a ray of light through a dark cloud. It's the smiling face in providence guiding things to the glorious end of salvation and peace and the kingdom to come on this earth. That's God's plan for the world and everything is moving according to His sovereign will toward a triumphant end. It's a certainty. We will triumph. That's also true for us now individually. Before He formed us, He knew us and chose us. That is, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And by His grace, He brought us to faith. He will never let us go. And never let anything touch us that is not for our good. He's always faithful. By faith, we may rest in that. 
In Cooper's words, judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. But if you're here without Christ, his face is not smiling toward you. You're under judgment. But he invites you to come to his son to trust in him who died for sinners. The invitation is to believe in him, recognize your guilt and your need of a savior, trust in him and in his sacrifice, lay hold of it by faith. And through that, you will experience the removal of sin and guilt and forgiveness, all that you need. It's there in Christ, and He receives everyone who comes to Him. May God help you to do that, and help all of us to stand firm in the truth. Let's end our service with a hymn, and let's end with that very hymn that I've been referring to. It's hymn number three in the Songs of Praise book. God moves in a mysterious way. Let's stand and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number three. Lord, much about life and much about our experience is a mystery. We don't understand why things happen as they do. But what we do know is you are a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God who is in control of it all and has designed it all and you have a good purpose for us in it. So give us eyes to see that, hearts to understand that. Bless those that are going through particular difficulty at this time. Encourage and strengthen them and give all of us courage to stand firm for the gospel and for your truth in the midst of a dark world. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, Amen.